good evening everyone i hope you all are safe and healthy i dr himanshu patel welcome you all to the webinar on intercor posture management program on behalf of iep technical team i warmly welcome to we are live on on behalf of iap technical team i warmly welcome to our resource person dr jay sanjan and dr priya dashini we are live on iap india youtube page you can subscribe to this channel for getting regular updates during the presentation if any of you have any question to the speaker you can put it on in a question answer section or chat box now i hand over to mrs chandini or our moderator uh, dr smita singh thank you Hello everyone and a very good evening hope you all are doing well and keeping safe i am chandini i will be the it facilitator or coordinator for today's session and will be there to assist you throughout the session before we kick off the session let's all stand for our national anthem जन गण मन अधिनायक जय रहे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा डाबिर उत्कल बंगा विंध हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जल धितरंगा तब शुभ नाम जागे तब शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तब जय गाथा जन गण मंगल गायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे thank you today's webinar topic is 24 hours postural management program iapwc bihar has organized this webinar under the guidance of iap national i'll read out some rules before we kick, get started with this webinar for a hassle free webinar please follow the instructions which i am reading out sit in a quiet location where you will not be disturbed use appropriate equipments please post all your doubts queries on your right hand side of screen in chat window we will get back to all of your questions at the end of the session in question and answer round on this note i would like to invite dr smita ma'am to take this webinar forward well no matter how hard the path is you always begin again iap has proved it we are back in wcpc after so many years congratulations to all of us and a very strong lady is with us today uh well dr ruchi vashni ma'am who is treasurer iap and uh, national coordinator iap wc so most welcome ma'am thank you and congratulations ma'am to all of us yes ma'am well your hard work has proved actually thank you <laughs> so uh, today's webinar is on postural 24 hours postural management So posture is one of the most important stands, right? Defined as the overall alignment and position of the body, posture is dependent on a variety of both internal and external factors. When posture is correct, it enhances your physical and mental prowess. But when posture is poor, it can cause pain, 
poor concentration and even problems with breathing and digestion. As we get older, bad habits such as slouching and inactivity cause muscle fatigue and tension that ultimately lead to poor posture. If you want an example of good posture, just look at a young child. Their back shows a graceful S curve and their movements are easy and effortless. Body posture failure in children and adolescents constitutes one of the most popular yet underestimated cardiorespiratory efficacy decreases, decreased vital capacity of the lungs, degenerative bones, low back pain, spinal dysfunction, rounded shoulders, and pot belly, as well as the displacement of the internal organs and just some of the consequences of untreated incorrect body postures for the at-risk children. Distortions of posture and impaired movements are key challenges in the care of children and adults with cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is one of the most common physical disabilities affecting children. CP is an umbrella term covering a group of non-progressive but often challenging motor impairment syndrome, secondary to lesions or abnormalities, rising in the early stages of development. Well, the causes of the basic, the purpose of this webinar is to further explore the mechanism within the position leading to distortion hypothesis. The webinar will elaborate on how and where distortions can be predicted, prevented, and cares of the support. Namaste to all of you and a warm welcome. Today we all have joined here for 24 hours portion management program presented jointly by a perfect couple and a perfect <laughs> professional, Dr. Jay Chandran J. Sir, who is working as a clinical lead, and Dr. Priya Darshni J. Ma, as a clinical specialist. We call them uh, JC and Priya Ma. So most of the time when I'll be talking between, I'll be using these terms because we are most used to these terms, right? So uh, they are working in these Cadwaldar University Health Board, United Kingdom. They are having 21 years of clinical teaching and research experience. Both of them did their master's in pediatrics. They completed postgraduate diploma in rehabilitation in All India Institute, Mumbai, and later specialized in pediatrics, physio, and go back therapy. And Priya Man specialized in pediatrics and go back therapy. Both of them moved to UK in 2005. They are involved in various research projects and continuing their journey to practice and learn pediatric physics. In spite of the fact that children with cerebral palsy may not have any deformity at the time of birth, social deformities such as scoliosis, pelvic obliquity, and rinsed hip deformity can appear with increasing age. This may lead to respiratory function distortion and in more severe cases affects survival. To date, postural care is believed to help improve the health and quality of life of children with cerebral palsy. This webinar will provide an overview of the cause and clinical management of postural deformity that is seen in children with cerebral palsy. So, without wasting time, first I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Ruchi Vashne, ma'am, to say a few words. Uh, yeah. Good evening, all. Uh, good evening, our esteemed resource persons, Jay Chandran, sir, and Priyadarshini, ma'am. Good evening. Thank you, good evening to all the panelists. It's been a great day, sir. You have joined us today on the auspicious day of Eid. So it is uh, Eid Mubarak to all. And uh, today, like WCPT has, uh, World Physiotherapy has officially announced the readmittance of IAP back 
and after so many years we are back to the like international arena so i think you all must be uh, feeling uh, what what actually it is to come back after so many years so much pressure so much uh, you know we have come out of lot of uh, problems issues and as you know the country has faced and in this difficult period the webinars and the esteemed resource persons like you smita madam has been able to bring the jewels back to the country back to the indian platform and this is iap india platform where we have conducted in these last two months more than 150 webinars by the esteemed uh, principals resource persons all indians uh, uh, as such everybody is you know so much excited and even uh, wcpt when asked for our link that uh, we want to like share the youtube link on their site as well so it was a great achievement and thanks to smita madam to you know keep the momentum going on for bihar iap wc and thank you reena ma'am to you know look after the entire east zone thank you all i will not waste much of your time it's been a great day i'm very happy and i'm very thankful to both of you sir and madam to share your expertise with all of us the entire country is watching and i think it will be a great webinar thank you thank you so much so without wasting time i request sir and ma'am to take up the session so proceed sir so please sir take up yeah thanks thanks smita thanks ruchi you no know, uh, thanks uh, smita for the nice introduction you know um i think you gave a good introduction to the topic as well so i could actually you know um jump few slides straight away no sir you're not supposed to We are eagerly waiting, no, waiting from so many years for your presentation, you know. That's no, okay. Um, we kept it simple uh, anyway. Uh, let me see if I can start off with uh, this slide. Yeah. Okay. Like, can you all see the slide now? Yes. Yeah, and um, can you hear us properly? How is the audio quality, Chandni? Is it yeah, okay? Yes, sir. yes, sir. We can hear it very loud and clear. Great. Okay. So uh, I'm going to start off with the session, and um, as you mentioned, like you know, any queries, so, like I'll leave it for you to collate, and then maybe at the end of the session, um, so if you want to read out, so we'll be more than welcome to answer all those questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's going to be me and my wife Priya. So uh, I will start the session, and I'll pass it over to Priya, and then like you know, uh, we'll conclude the session. Um, uh this particular topic 24 hour partial program uh, mainly focused for children with cerebral palsy or anyone any and adults with spasticity you know what's uh, that's our main focus uh, today um as it said it's it's a very like you know um, like you know uh, wide topic you know uh, where you can cover um this whole day you can talk about this whole day you know so we used to do like workshops and you know uh, seminars Uh, but then to um, squeeze you know, all that to an hour, like you know, is going to be a challenging. So I'm just going to uh, skip some of the bits and maybe uh, focus on the uh, importance of 24-hour partial program. Um, so uh, with that uh, as my note, like you now I will give a start. Um, so with the uh, pediatric um, and other like you know um, um, management strategies for um, uh, neurology and you know, our uh, specialization not just pediatric um, so we just focus on like task focused activities so when we say task focused activities it could be like bobath approach so it's mostly to do with you know the, the international classification for function and then where you just focus it's all goal oriented at the moment so there are many approaches like you know which falls under task focused activities and i'm sure most of them who are practicing pediatric and neuro are familiar with this and you know, activities so i'm not going to you know tell too much about, about you know the task focused activities today and obviously muscle strengthening um so we do hydro stretching postural management program manual handling um so manual handling is is big um particularly here in uk um so obviously when we treat children and adults um so as part of the uh, postural program so we have to plan the manual handling as well uh, which includes like choosing the right you know uh, slings you know for their uh, transfers from wheelchair to chair or wheelchair to plinth and so on so um, that's part of our anova you know, plan uh, which has to be included you know within the um, the individual uh, goal 
treatment handling uh, is again uh, more like to do with the um, manual handling. Uh, this is more specific when you actually, you know, um, deal with like, you know, treating children on physio rolls or gym balls where you have to transfer them from plinth to the gym ball. So again, a lot of planning involved because here uh, it's not the physio who always does the handling bit. So you actually do the program, demonstrate the program, and then it's either the parents or the carers or the support staff will be actually doing the program or carrying out the program every day. So it's very important that we plan. And, and so um, <clears throat> everyone who's involved you know, with the treatment of these children, uh, so they keep maintain some consistencies. So when they uh, handle the child or when they treat the child. Uh, obviously, you all must have heard about constraint induced therapy, which is again more popular uh, for um, certain um, conditions uh, like hemiplegia and, and you know, stroke uh, and, and so on. Um, so, yes, there are various management strategies, uh, but today we'll be focusing more around the postural management program. So, what are the goals? Um, so, just to uh, put it in a nutshell, um, so as Smitha said, the importance of posture, uh, it's not only for children with cerebral palsy or uh, like, you know, uh, patients who have um, problems with the you know, brain damage or even low motor lesion, like, you know, it doesn't matter, even normal. So it is very important that, you know, uh, we maintain a symmetrical posture. Uh, so when you say symmetry, um, the basic, basic thing that we expect is, uh, you know, uh, for the optimum posture is to uh, maintain energy efficiency or ergonomic. Um, so same thing and applies to you know, uh, children and adults. Um, so and also prevent contractures and delay or reduce the need for surgical intervention. So obviously when you maintain the posture, um, you can prevent you know, from, um, from developing contractures. This is very important, you know, particularly as a physio, you know, that's what we do here and we focus. And you also are consultant surgeons or you know, physicians. They give so much importance to this um, because the more we could actually intervene them at the early stage, so we can try and prevent the tightness and contracture or even to some extent deformity. Um, so which means we can actually delay you know, the process uh, for the need of major surgical interventions. Um, and that's key, you know, that's the underlying you know, um, goal you know, and, and aim you know, for all this postural management program. Facilitate mobility, why posture is important for mobility. Um, as we all know, there's a strong link you know, between stability and mobility. Um, to keep it simple, um, so you need very good proximal stability. When we say proximal stability, that includes neck, trunk, pelvis, they are proximal stability. So when you have good proximal stability, so obviously you know, the distal mobility, which is our distal joints, like you know, arms and legs, the mobility improves like you know so it's very important for us to achieve or provide them a good stability so we could actually try and enhance their mobility uh, facilitate inclusion i have to include that because it is very important so as soon as you give them a good stability good chair or good wheelchair so that's going to enhance their function so so that really facilitates you know, um, you know in terms of uh, inclusion in the schools, education, work area, so any, any uh, so so basically, to uh, for them to actively participate, you know, in in, in um, classroom settings or in work settings. Facilitate communication. It is very important, as I said, as soon as you get the proximal stability, you, you get and and try and maintain the symmetrical posture. You can actually improve their communication. It could be either the verbal, as soon as you get some good head controls. Obviously, the more more of or a motor control will improve. Um, also, it's not just the speech. It could be uh, them using other communication aids. It could be like um, the visual aids, or it could be there are so many and over communication aids at the moment. Um, so where they lack upper limb movement, but they can actually use their hands. So if you provide them a good posture, they should be able to access it. It's basically providing them an easy access to all these communication aids. So they can use their head control to move the head switch or like even the oromotor control using puff and puff switch to like operate the wheelchairs or even eye dissociation from head. Uh, again, you need a very good you know, proximal control, head control or headrest. So for them to actually move their eyes or dissociate their eyes from head. So 
in which like we can actually uh, know, uh, facilitate them using uh, the high gear systems for, for communication. Obviously, it's going to improve the automotor control, facilitate feeding and comfort. Uh, so postural management, uh, poor postural management has serious consequences. As I said, we did discuss about all the goals. Um, and if you don't maintain a good posture, um, so there are some serious consequences with their anatomical development, physiological function. Uh, phys that includes most of things like, like you know, um, feeding, swallowing, respiration, digestion, bowel and bladder control. Um, so it does have a, a, um, a big impact on physiological function. Uh, management of altered tone. Um, so as I said, it's not just for spasticity, it could be acidosis, it could be for uh, flaccidity. So as we move along, so I'll be able to discuss uh, uh, in detail uh, about this. Uh, mobility, we discussed already. So if you, if you can achieve good stability, you should be able to you know, uh, facilitate a good mobility. Uh, ability to weight bear, manual handling, uh, as said, um, less the contracture, less the deformity. It's easy, you know, for manual handling and treatment handling. So you are trying to improve, you know, the manual handling skills uh, and also delay, you know, um, any contractures or prevent, um, prevent, you know, for the deformity. It, um, uh, it improves the sensory perceptual development. Orthopedic surgery, as said, it's key here because as a physio, uh, we try our best to maintain their you know, posture and, and um, maintain the range of movement. Um, so that way, uh, so we can prevent you know, them from developing tightness contractures. So the more we actually delay, as we can actually prevent all major you know, uh, joint surgeries. Provision of equipment, again, um, if you have less problems if the problems are mild to moderate so the provision of equipment is cost effective so you don't have to go for a molded seating or molded backrest and you know, all the hi-fi you know text you know. so uh, more the deformity if the deformity is more structural including rotational deformities and if it's fixed then the provision of equipment is going to be expensive and more effort um, so we need to then look at more like a bespoke molded uh, individual tailor-made you know, backrest and headrest and seat and so on. Um, so yes, it does have an, uh, a direct impact on provision of equipment. Going forward, so postural management strategies. Yes, uh, it's very important that we consider including 24 postural management into our physio program to prevent or delay the development of contractures and deformities and enable individual to take, take part in activities. So that's key, isn't it? So at the end of the day, it's not just stretching and maintaining the joint range. It's, it's actually, you know, uh, it has to improve the function. You know, uh, so that's, that's key. So that has to be our goal. And all these postural management strategies will, will facilitate that, you know, um, and will enable them to be independent and take active participation, you know, in school and work setting. And when using uh, 24 postural strategies, um, it is very important that we consider low load active stretching or low load passive stretching. I have to emphasize on this uh, because we as a physio, um, particularly uh, for um, individual with spasticity, have to move on a little bit uh, because um, there are a lot of evidences about low load active stretching and low load passive stretching. Um, so I'll come to uh, what it is. Because with passive stretching, and like you know, um, it's it's very uh, less effective. Uh, but it is very important that we consider low load, you no know, passive stretching or low load active stretching. So what is low load active stretching? It's nothing but you know uh, an intervention in which the person actively stretches their muscle. Uh, so for example, if the child say for example a mild CP diplegic, the child can walk and and sit down and and so they can actually you know, come down to long sitting and stretch their own hamstrings. So that way, so we should be able to um, facilitate the safer you know, way of uh, maintaining their flexibility. Um, and they know when to stop. You now, if it hurts, they know when to stop because it's active stretching. But when it becomes passive stretching, so we might overstretch and damage the muscle. Uh, so active stretching is, is good so, and they can do as much as possible um, throughout the day. So uh, that's what we encourage uh, for those children or individual who can actually do uh, low load active stretching. 
For those children who can't, um, so we then focus on low load passive stretching. So what it is, it's nothing but an intervention involving sustained stretching using positioning with equipment, orthosis or serial casting. So that's what we'll be focusing today. Uh, because it's not just an R session is going to help these children or individual, you know, with spasticity. Uh, it is very important, you know, after our hands-on session, they maintain, you know, the benefits. Uh, so to sustain the benefits, it is very important, you know, that we actually, you know, recommend, you know, all this positioning equipment. So they should be able to sustain the benefits, sustain the therapeutic benefits, like, you know, or sustain the benefits of our hands-on session. So, uh, so we use various, uh, the wide range of uh, like, you know, equipment to achieve you know, low load uh, passive stretching. Okay, so before we move on, um, it is very important you know, uh, to identify uh, those individuals who are at risk of postural distortion. And I'm not going to go in detail because there's so much like, you know, of, um, of assessment tools like, you know, available. Um, uh, uh, so, and, 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 and depends what you want to choose. But what we want to focus is identifying individual, like, you know, so with altered tone, as I said, it's not just spasticity. They can have fluctuating tone, they can have low tone, they can have um, uh, uh, um, increased activity or rigidity, you know, uh, in one uh, group of uh, muscles, or, or it could be muscle imbalance, reduced range of movement. Also, when it comes to children or stroke, like, you know, so, uh, we should, uh, it is very important that we also assess the primitive reflexes uh, because sometimes these primitive reflexes can influence the posture. Like for example, asymmetrical tonic neck reflex or symmetrical tonic neck reflex. So if they retain these primitive reflexes and these reflexes are very strong and I've seen so many children who retain these primitive reflexes becomes a real challenge for us to maintain the posture and maintain the symmetry. So it is very important that we focus on primitive reflexes. Unfortunately, I'm not going to talk in detail about primitive reflexes. As I said, we need a longer session to talk about primitive individual reflexes and what influence these reflexes have on Bosch. Maybe that's for a, um, in a separate session. Um, and also uh, poor spatial awareness and cognitive ability and reduced core stability. As I said, there's a strong link between the stability and mobility. And that's what we are aiming to achieve. Uh, right, uh, so 24 hour postural management. So it is very important as a physio or even an OT that we consider all the relevant postures an individual has the ability to adopt uh, over the 24 hour postural period. So when I say that, uh, the spasticity is an umbrella term, cerebral palsy an umbrella term. Um, so, uh, and the level of, severity you know can vary and the level of ability can vary so it is very important as a physio we then assess them and and identify what their you know what potential is so we got really explore to what they can actually adopt over the 24 hour postal period can they stand if they can stand can they stand upright or if they can't stand upright can they actually use the tilt table or can they use walker? Can they use the walker with trunk control? Like, like you know, um, so it's just trying to identify what level of support, what level of ability, you know, they have to adopt, you know, various postures over the 24 hour postural period. Why it is important? Because they'll be able to sustain the therapeutic benefits and it's important for their growth and development. So uh, the three core postural orientations are obviously lying. Uh, sitting and standing, and that's what we'll be focusing more on um, the various equipment that actually assists, like, you know, us to um, attain or achieve a good posture in these postures today. Right. Um, so, how I put this slide, as I said, it's not just for spasticity, it could be for altered tone. And clearly, this slide, you know, you can see this um, young little girl. Um, using the large base of support. So as soon as you position, as soon as you transfer her to the plane, you can see she's taking, you can see her upper limbs, you can see her lower limbs, so like, you know, she's, she's just externally rotating and she's taking large base of support. And clearly with the uh, attitude of the limbs and a posture, you can clearly say that she's got low tone and low trunk control. 
uh, and that's why you can see she's taking large base of support. And as we move on, I'll, I'll, I'll show you another slide. Now what we achieved you know, for this angle and also for um, children with spasticity or individual with spasticity. You could clearly see here, uh, this angle uh, has got a windswept deformity more towards the left side. Um, obviously spasticity, um, she's got spastic quadriplegia. Um, typical, like an you know, uh, uh, flexosynergic pattern, uh, asymmetry in the trunk, uh, shortening on the right side, pelvic obliquity, right uh, lower limb internally rotated and adducted. So it's all to do with spasticity. Then as a physio, we identify, okay, so how much of flexibility she has, whether it's fixed, or whether it's partially, you know, uh, um, correctable, or whether it's correctable. So that's where we jump in, like, you know, uh, do a detailed evaluation. Uh, to see what ability and what level of uh, know, uh, tightness and contracture you know, uh, the individual has. Right, um, so provision of equipment. So uh, as I said, uh, we got to try and explore the various postures that you know, this individual can adapt you know, over the 24-hour postural, 24-hour uh, period. So seating, which is key. So when we say seating, uh, here in UK, the practice is, if it's for an individual child, uh, as a physio, we assess the posture and we got to provide them uh, uh, an appropriate posture. So uh, that will actually uh, facilitate them to uh, engage and actively participate in the education. So we assess for the classroom chair and then we assess for the home chair, which is more like a comfy chair there at home. And um, we also assess for wheelchair, like, you know, for uh, posture and also, you know, which improves their mobility. So when it comes to seating, yes, so it is going to be class chair, it's going to be their home chair, and it's going to be their wheelchair. And standing, so there are various um, range of products that's available in the market, which Priya will be you know, uh, discussing with you today about standing and the importance of standing and, and the various types of equipment that's available for standing. Walkers, uh, again, uh, how we could facilitate walking, uh, it depends on the level of control that they have. So we're going to explore various types of walkers, uh, what's available to, uh, for, uh, for us to facilitate this individual uh, walking and lying. So when they sleep, because in the daytime, yes, it's good. They can they up against gravity using their own weight to, uh, to achieve stretching, sustained stretching. But in the nighttime, so obviously that's the longer time I know, uh, which they spend in the nighttime. And it is very important for us to maintain some level of symmetry uh, in the nighttime. So they don't actually you know, uh, develop tightness or contraction. So it is very important that we recommend you know, uh, for the right um, sleep systems. Again, Priya will be discussing in detail. So moving on to seating. Um, so yes, assessment and provision of seating uh, can be carried out uh, by physio or OT. Uh, why? To achieve symmetrical seating posture and um, to enhance their function. And it is recommended that we use um, the Chaley levels of ability. As I said, there are the various assessment tools, uh, but here, like, you know, we mainly focus on Chaley's levels of ability. So what it is, so, uh, so we have Chaley's level one to five. Um, so basically one is very severe. And as we go up, like you no know, five um, is, is very mild. So what is one? Um, so when we say characteristics of the child, it's basically asymmetric deformity uh, where we cannot actually place the child into a seating posture. So it's going to be a real challenge uh, because they do have, it could be altered tone, increased spasticity, very strong reflex activity, or it could be the tightness or contracture, more rotational deformities. Um, so then it's a challenge you know, as a physio for us to position them or to achieve a good seating posture. So child is level one is basically when they have asymmetry, and severe deformity where you know, it's, it's really difficult for us to place them into a seating posture. So yes, okay, uh, so, so yes, we, we have this severity, they do have uh, structural problems. So as a physio, how can we support them? So just 
trying to identify the right system for them. So basically, children or individual with this level of severity, they basically uh, benefit from the molded seat or molded backrest. So we then actually recommend for a bespoke or, or an individual tailor-made uh, seating for them. Uh, that mainly focuses on a comfort. What what we want to achieve, you know, for this individual is to give them a total contact. So this molded seating system will will accommodate the deformity, uh, will prevent you know from further contracture and deformities. Uh, also, it provides them like a total contact, so you can then achieve an equal weight distribution. So thereby you are actually trying to uh, prevent pressure so which is very very important because these children are very high risk you now at developing pressure so uh, because they do develop very structural deformity rotational bony prominences so unless you give them a molded back and and facilitate uh, equal weight bearing uh, it's it's hard you know for us to achieve comfort and if you can't achieve comfort um, the sitting tolerance is going to reduce and if the sitting tolerance reduces obviously they're not going to long leg the portion so if, if you don't give them comfort any posture that you're trying to achieve is going to be short lived so so you as a physio it's very important for us to keep that balance you, you don't want to over correct them achieve symmetry but they're not comfortable um, so so we need to keep that balance so yes, um, so yeah, you need a good fit and the main aim is to give them comfort. Uh, child is level two and three. Um, so individual under these categories are basically, yes, they do have some level of tightness. They do have some level of um, contractures and deformity, but they can be partially correctable or correctable. Uh, so for this uh, individual, all we need is a functional position, a good proximal stability. Um, so which where we can achieve that you know, by providing external supports like headrest, thoracic laterals, pelvic laterals, and you know, footrest and you know, accessories. And so you can actually provide these external supports in the chair to maintain uh, a, a symmetry or an optimum midline posture. So that's all they need you know, for um, uh, individual who fall under trailers level two or three. Moving on, uh, four and five. Uh, so these individuals where they are actually ambulant, walking, weight bearing, uh, and they can actually maintain a balance to some extent, but when they reach out, they might lose their balance. When they go move out of the base of support, they might lose the balance. So all we want to achieve as a physio is to give them a stable base, like you know, so they can actually feel safe within the base of support. And we can achieve this by providing various external supports like chest harness, like pelvic harness, uh, and there are various types of supports and harnesses available like, you know, in the market. Um, so yeah, so that's how we achieve. And for these individuals who fall under four and five, all they need is just a basic level of external support to maintain a, a stability and give them their good uh, base of support to facilitate function. Okay, uh, as I said, I'm not going to talk uh, about evaluation. That's a separate topic by itself. But as a physio, most of you uh, should be like, you know, uh, uh, expert, you know, in these areas. Um, so when it comes to seating, standing, so obviously measurements are very key, you know, uh, to find the level of support. And also, so then by taking the right measurements, you should be able to prescribe and recommend the right level of support, the right level of trunk support, uh, laterals that's required, pelvic laterals required for these individuals. Yes, yeah, so measurements are key. Um, so I'm just looking to move again when it comes to wheelchair, there are loads of other measurements which we got to consider. And also it is very important that we note effects of gravity on posture. So when we do evaluate them, so it's not just you know, uh, evaluate them in lying posture, because in lying, so you are obviously uh, assessing them in elimination of gravity. So it is very important that you do uh, the postural assessment in lying, and also if possible, try and give them the support and bring them into a sitting posture. So you then actually know what effect or impact the gravity have on their posture and tone. 
Uh, so that should give you a clear picture, particularly when you're doing seating assessments, it is very important because that's the position, like, you know, so we want them to achieve. So you, you need to know the effects of gravity on the seating portion. So that way you can actually prescribe the right level of external support that's required for them. So yes, so need of support, alignment of spine, tone motor control, misalignments, effect of external support. So all that, you know, uh, will be, you know, um, looking, you know, when we actually do the evaluation, but that's a nutshell. So we do a, a detailed assessment uh, when we do an ass eating assessment. Um, but just uh, to share some uh, slides. Um, uh, okay, so when I say as a physio, we evaluate them. So obviously we uh, observe them in their existing seating uh, equipment um, to see, okay, so what position they adapt. Um, so uh, what's going uh, wrong with their existing equipment. Uh, with this little uh, englad, like you can clearly see, um, uh, is posture in the wheelchair. Um, wheelchair, it's a very basic wheelchair, no external support just armrest and footrest. Um, but obviously you could clearly see in the slide, he tends to lean more towards his left side. And also you could see the head posture. Sorry, I have to cut his um, head. Um, I have to you know, blind the identity. Um, but on the other slide, you, have, you can clearly see the head posture and neck posture. This is not because of tightness, contracture or deformity, yeah? This is because of his visual field. And that's the posture he actually prefers. So he has to lean more towards his left side. And, 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 and so his visual field, and so he can actually see. Um, so it is very important you know, for us to learn you know, uh, or get a bigger picture of, of, uh, of the individual. Uh, so if you try and achieve symmetry for this angle, so you're going to actually take off or knock his vision off. Uh, that's his preferred portion. So we got to actually encourage him to lean towards his left side, uh, particularly when he's seating, because that is his preferred portion. So that's an example you know, uh, to give you uh, why it is important to also look into the functional aspects. So it's very important that we gather information you know, about the vision, speech, language, communication aids, what level of ability they have to actually access the communication. As said, the key thing is, is not to just to maintain symmetry uh, and, and achieve midline posture. The main aim is to improve their function and, and improve uh, and facilitate inclusion in their you know, uh, work setting and education. Okay, so moving on. Um, so I'll be just quickly moving on with some basic you know, assessment that we do. Uh, yes, we look at uh, pelvic posture, uh, which is very important because pelvis is the uh, base of support in sitting um, and it's a keystone. So if you get the pelvis right, uh, obviously, you know, uh, the spine, head and neck you know, will align um, if, if they are flexible. Uh, if they are fixed, obviously, you know, you, your uh, recommendation changes. But it is very important to start off with pelvis. Uh, so with pelvis, so what do we actually um, look in for? Uh, pelvis test or pelvic obliquity. Um, so with this slide, you can actually see, I've indicated the arrow. You could see with this uh, little boy, um, the pelvis is tilted more on his left side. Uh, so we call it as pelvic obliquity on the left. So we always go with the side that's tilted down. Um, and with this angle, you could clearly see her pelvis is tilted on the right side. So we know just observing them, we know, yes, they do have pelvic obliquity. Uh, but what we want to know is, are they fixed? Are they correctable? Are they partially correctable? Because it is very important. If they are correctable, so you just have to plan for some external support, um, then we can achieve a midline pelvis or neutral pelvis. If they are fixed, then your plan of intervention changes because you got to provide them some, something like a molded seat to accommodate that tilt. And as you know, in the early slide, I did mention about if they are more complex, more fixed deformity, then you got to actually try and accommodate the deformity, provide the total weight bearing. So if it is fixed, you then plan for more like a molded seating or molded backrest. And if they are correctable, then we can achieve the correction by providing them the right external support. So you put your hands on, 
as a physio. Then you try and correct it. So then you can feel the resistance. You know how much it is correctable. Can we correct, like, you know, bring it back to midline? Or yes, I can correct partially 50 percentage, but the the rest of the you know uh, deformity. So it's, it's like a residual deformity or a fixed deformity. So you know how much correction you can achieve, and how much is a residual structural deformity. So yes, it's very important for us to observe and then put a hands on and identify whether they are fixed or flexible. Um, this is the young lad uh, uh, I showed you in the previous slide on the wheelchair, uh, where he tends to lean more towards his left. But clearly in this slide, you can see Priya, so he's trying to um, assess uh, his pelvic posture. You can clearly see he's able to sit upright uh, with a little bit of uh, anterior pelvic tilt and exaggerated lumbar lordosis. But that's more to with this um, pelvic tilt and lumbar lordosis in the sagittal plane. But in the frontal plane, you can actually you know, sit upright and maintain symmetry. But in the wheelchair, he prefers to lean more towards his left because he wants to uh, uh, see. Um, so yeah, so moving on, pelvic tilt, anterior pelvic tilt. You could clearly see the pelvis is tilted anterior and, um, and you can also see the exaggerated lumbar lordosis. And on the other slide, it's other way around, it's posterior pelvic tilt and uh, with compensated um, lower and also the upper um, spine kyphosis. So yeah, so it actually spine and you know, hip joint obviously will try and compensate like, you know, uh, for the pelvis. Um, in sitting, if the pelvis is tilted or even in standing, obviously the spine is going to compensate you know, for the tilt. Uh, but what we want to again check is how much you know uh, uh, flexibility or how much correction we can achieve. So then you put your hands on and, and try and correct the pelvis. So see if you can actually bring the pelvis back to neutral position. Are they correctable? Uh, so that that's the kind of information we are actually looking for. Same again, uh, how much of correction you can achieve in lying position? You can clearly see um, the elongation that we can achieve on the left side. In lying, so you want to know how much like enough correction is achievable in the elimination of gravity. Yeah, in sitting, moving on to spine, you could clearly see, so there's no external support. All we are asking is uh, for this um, little boy to lift his arms up to the side and we can clearly see there's so much of correction that's achievable. Now, uh, so he has the ability to actively correct himself so all we got to do is try and you know, give him the right base of support you know, for him to achieve that. Um, but if they can't actually actively correct, then as a physio, we then use, a, like, you know, a put your hands on, try and elongate, see how much of correction you, know, you can achieve. And clearly you can see how much of correction is achievable. So what information we gather from that is basically, yes, um, she has coliosis, she has left, thoracolumbar scoliosis with the pelvic tilt, but it is all correctable. So just with some external support, we should be able to try and achieve an optimum midline portion. And if you can't elongate, then you actually put your hands on and try and see if you can actually, you know, correct the curvature. So that way you are basically simulating the level of support. So by putting your hands on uh, and then you know, okay, at what level, like, you know, you can achieve uh, an optimum correction. So that gives uh, an information to the physio. Okay, so you can achieve a maximum correction at, at lower trunk. So then you plan for a lateral trunk support at that level. So all that is information for physio to prescribe and recommend the right uh, level of external support. Uh, same again with this young little girl, you can see the level of correction that is achievable um, on the right side. You can see the abdominal crease on the right side uh, without any external support. But as soon as you try and push, um, you can achieve so much of correction. Uh, but at the same time, I should admit, um, we are not able to achieve um, full correction. You can still see there is some residual scoliosis. Um, so this angle has got a residual scoliosis, but at least 80% of a scoliosis are correctable. So with external support. Um, same girl on the um, sagittal view, 
Um, so you can clearly see the abdominal creases and the amount of correction uh, you can achieve um, in seating. Same again uh, with this uh, little boy. Uh, unfortunately, um, the posture that you see, like you know, uh, on the right side and left side, including his trunk, is all fixed deformity. Uh, because when he was little, his, his hip was fused, and then as he was developing, he developed structural scoliosis and fixed deformities in his lower limbs. <coughs> Excuse me. So moving on with their assessment. So we tried um, assessing them in lying, sitting, uh, to identify the effects of gravity, and also put a hands-on to, to see how much of uh, deformity is correctable. Uh, and also in this slide, you can clearly see um, we just changed the base of support. So on this, so there's a flat surface. On this, we just provided them a wedge cushion and you can clearly see the amount of correction that's achievable um, with this uh, little boy. Um, on the first slide, he had um, general kyphosis, but on the other slide, as soon as you change the base of support, just with the little cushion, there are various types of cushion, um, you can clearly see the amount of correction that's achievable. So sometimes, as I said, earlier you assess and you can just provide a simple seating solutions. But if you catch them later, obviously the level of contraction deformity is going to be severe and complex. And then you are looking at more um, complex like ANOVA solutions, uh, like molded cushions and so on. <clears throat> and also we trial them in the chair and various chairs. And this is the girl we saw, like, you know, a floppy. Um, so she does have general kyphosis. And you could clearly see the back support on this particular chair has got like a upper back support and the lower back support and with a little knob where you can actually correct the upper and the lower end. Um, that's basically you can accommodate uh, kyphosis to some extent. So, so you still can accommodate using these type of seating solutions. But if they develop more contracture and rotational deformity, then this modular seating system will not be able to actually uh, uh, give them uh, a correction. Then you will have to go for more complex um, seating solutions. Various types of headrest that's available. Um, sorry, I have to move on, so we haven't got much time. And clearly you can see a headrest with chin support. That's basically for those children who haven't got very good head control. So you still have to maintain the head control. So this head control, you can clearly see that will allow them to move their head side to side. But what we don't want is them to flop their head down because that's not a good head position uh, to enable them to actually uh, feed, swallow. So you need a neutral head alignment. So these little chin prongs should actually enable you know, them to maintain their head in neutral and that should facilitate a good oromotor motor control. Likewise, uh, this is a girl like we saw in the first slide, floppy, like you know, um, using a large base of support, but clearly you can see, you can actually position her in seating position, achieve 90-90, good midline posture by providing a good lateral thigh support, lateral trunk support, a good head support, but because she's so floppy, um, she she flops her head and she loses her head control. But there are many types of chin prompts and uh, forehead prompts that's available at the moment. Um, so where you can actually add to the head control. Um, so you clearly you can see uh, what we tried for this young girl uh, is like a little forehead support on the right side and a little a prompt on the uh, left side. Um, it was challenging for us to actually find a right head support for this angle because she had like a VP shunt coming at the back. It's quite sensitive and she had a hearing aid on both the side. And also she had a line that's, that's going to her actually uh, lung. So she had all the sensitive lines and controls uh, just behind her here. So we got to try and avoid. So we, we have to choose a right level of support. Um, and also choose the right uh, headrest for her. But this headrest uh, 
provided her the optimum support and the prompt uh, prevented her head from flopping forward. <clears throat> like again, you can see the various level of chest hardness that's available, the pelvic support, and like a little pummel to prevent them from crossing the legs. And there are various types of footrest that's available. Um, so these are all the accessories that you can actually add to the individual seating system. Likewise, there are chairs that's available uh, to accommodate the limb length discrepancy. This is the angle where she had uh, severe shortening on the right side, um, but also she had a windsep deformity and a limb length discrepancy. But clearly you could see we do have a seat that can actually split and that can accommodate um, windswept deformity. Also, the seat can be moved one side forward <clears throat> and the other side backwards to accommodate limb length discrepancy. Um, so yes, to a certain level, if they are flexible, we should be able to achieve these corrections and accommodate you know, uh, the deformity. And if they are very severe with rotational deformity and fixed deformities, obviously we got to go for molded seating. You could clearly see the molded back and molded uh, seat. Um, sorry, I have to um, move on. I like you know, I'm uh, skip a few things. Um, obviously, I'm conscious of time. Um, so I'm going to pass on to Priya to talk about um, standing frame and its benefits and various types of uh, uh, equipment that's available for standing and uh, lying. Smitha, is it audible? Is everything okay? Yes, sir. Are we okay to carry on? Yes. Great. I'm going to skip this video. I'm conscious of time. Uh, it's got the whole seating assessment. Thanks, Jay. Um, is everything clear? Can you all hear me? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I, if I'm right, Jay is through 24-hour uh, postural management and he's completed his seating section. Uh, what I'm going to present is about standing. Is that okay? Okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, so, you know, I, I think you all would agree with me that one of the most common questions uh, that we are asked um, as a physio, uh, if, you know, whether we're treating children or the adults, they ask is, you know, the first question we get is, when will my child be able to stand? Will he or she be able to walk? Or if it's an adult, you know, usually they ask about like, you know, when would he get off his bed and be on his feet? So it's one of the most common questions we ask. So that, that, that itself highlights how important the standing is for our patients. And if you, you know, and I would like to insist that standing is definitely not an overrated position. So it's, it's very important, both physiologically and developmentally for the children or the adult who treat. Um, so we are doing 24 hour postural management now. So we just need to think about what role it has to play in 24 hour postural management. Uh, why is it important? And what are the benefits associated with standing? I don't want to elaborate too much on it because we all know um, what role, what, what is the physiological benefit of standing? If you just look at it vaguely, we know like, you know, it helps with all the physiological process and all the physiological process of our body seems to be facilitated by the standing position. Um, if I'm right, uh, the current theory, it is proven that uh, when you're standing, our nervous system continuously and consciously monitors our direction and velocity. So which means uh, what happens is the vertical axis of our body in standing seem to be constantly tipping forward and backward. So which means if from the middle, it just keeps moving forward and backward. So what happens is before each of the tilt reaches its tipping point, our ner nervous system counteracts by a signal 
so that the muscle gets activated. So we come back to the upright position. So it's, it's constantly monitoring. So which itself is a good example for how the standing position facilitates various system of our body. Uh, the analogy to that would be like how a wall is volleyed between two players without hitting ground. So when you're standing, we don't end up face down position or we don't end up on our back because our nervous system is so active. And so likewise, if you just see your respiratory system works better in standing, which is proven, and all the other physiological system, including your muscular system, seem to be working so much better in standing. So clearly it's not an overrated. So we need to consider standing as part of any of the treatment that we use. Um, so here in the UK, we use it quite prevalently. And I mean, the standing position and the stand, uh, we call it the equipment which we use to facilitate standing. Um, and the market is flooded with a number of products. And obviously when, uh, when you have so many products, uh, the challenge is to decide about which standard am I going to use for my child or the adult I'm treating. Um, you know, if, if you think about stand, standard, when I say standard, you know, to a lay person or even for those who are fam not familiar with the standard, uh, you would think about what's there and choose in standing. Standing is standing, that's it, simple. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Um, it, Broadly, if you look at it, you have about three different choices uh, of standards that you can choose from. Uh, one is, you know, if, if you stand upright, the normal standing that we do, it's called as upright standing position. And the standard that we use for it is called upright standard. Um, if I could just show you that. Yeah, this is the upright standing frame. Um, if from the standing upright standing position, if we tilt ourselves a little bit backward, that's called as um, supine standing frame. So that's the one you're seeing now is called as a supine standing frame. And same way from the upright position, if you tilt yourself down forward so that your face is facing down, that's called as prone standing frame. So you have uh, basically three types of standing frame. One is the upright, one is a supine, and one is the prone standing frame. So if I just put it this way, you stand normally, that's your upright. And if you lie down on your back, that becomes your supine frame. And if you end up facing down the floor, that becomes your prone standing frame. Um, as I said, like, you know, the challenge is to choose the right frame for the children we're treating. Um, yeah, so what we use is, you know, how, how do we choose um, the standing frame? Which one is beneficial for individual child? We go with, um, based on GMFCS assessment. Um, for those who don't know GMFCS, it's gross motor functional classification system. And those who know about it, please excuse me. Um, so it's a five level scale. Um, it's a classification system, which is uh, which focuses mainly on children with cerebral palsy and with specialized focus on their ability to walk and sit. So it, it literally assess their ability, the level of their ability with walking and sitting. Higher the level, I mean, higher the score of GF, uh, GMFC is, uh, more the problem is. Uh, like, for example, if you could just see in the slide, um, level five, if you could see, uh, the person will be transported in a manual wheelchair. He or she doesn't have the ability to be on their feet. So if you look at level one, it clearly says they walk with without limitations. So higher the level of GMFCS, more the problem is. So this will dictate us what kind of standard we're going to use. Uh, obviously, if it's a level one, we could straight away think about upright standing frame. And if it's level five, based on how the child is presenting, you'll be choosing between the supine and prone. Okay, moving on further. Okay. Um, 
Right. What, what, as I said, with any equipment, uh, you know, we need to start with the individual assessment of the child. Um, so which will help us make a clinical decision of which standard you're going to prescribe for your patient. Um, here you could see in the slide, I've just considered a few of the factors which we use for the assessment. Um, as I've just explained now, uh, we start with the GMFCS level. Based on the level, we choose a type of standard for them. So that's one thing we've covered now. The second one is the head control. It's, it's quite common sense. If the head control is really good and you know straight away we could, you know, plus the trunk control is also good, we can straight away think of um, upright standard because there's not much challenging for them in that position. So you can use the upright standard for them. Um, when the trunk control and the head control is good. And if the spine, if, if in case if the child is struggling with the head control, well, obviously you can't put them upright. So you need to think of a supine standing frame where the head will be supported well. Uh, it will have support structure in place so that the head is holded in a nice comfortable position for the child to assume the standing position. And moving on further, spine assessment is another important thing. We need to think about whether the spine is symmetrical or if the child or the adult is presenting with the scoliosis and how severe the scoliosis is. Um, if they have no or minimal scoliosis, then the answer would be go for the upright standing frame because there's nothing challenging. Whereas when they have a little bit of scoliosis, it, it, it is going to make um, an issue to get them upright in the standard. So you can think of having a supine standing frame. Um, I'm sure we, we just looked at the picture of the supine frame where you had supports all throughout the standard, starting from the head, trunk level, pelvis, knees, and the foot. Um, in the coming slides, we can look, look at it in depth. So same thing about hip. The range of motion of hip is something uh, very important and it's very crucial when you consider the choice uh, of standing frame for your patient. Um, here we have um, something called as a CPIP, uh, which is called as cerebral palsy integrated pathway, uh, which highlights, which you know really targets and make sure that we regularly assess the child's hip range of motion and document it. The idea behind it is early intervention because we know, you know, if, if the hip range is lost, if the hip dislocation happens, the person is going to go off the feet. Um, so what they have done is, you know, they've given us a protocol so that we make sure that we assess the hip range of motion quite regularly. Uh, in case of any child is at the risk of losing range of motion, we immediately refer them to the consultant and they kickstart the other surgical or the Botox option for them. So we try to maintain the hip range. So that's one of the crucial point in considering uh, the choice of standard. Moving on to knees again. Um, it, um, sorry. Yeah, uh, the most common problem that we get with the knee is uh, flexion contractures. Um, if, the, if the child or the adult has got good range of motion in the knee, um, it's a straightforward answer, go for the upright standard. Uh, if it's the contractor is more than 20 degrees, and then it's quite, it becomes quite tricky to accommodate the knees in the upright frame. So you need to think about using a supine standing frame for them. Um, as, again, I would like to indicate like, you know, you do have supports in, the play, in place in the standing frame, so that becomes quite easier. Okay, the next one to consider is the ankle and foot. Um, in, in my experience with pediatrics, I've seen this is one area which de determines clearly whether the child is going to be able to stand for longer or not. Um, the hips may be fine, the spine is fine, the knee is good, they have good in tr trunk and head control, everything is fine. But if the ankle is deformed badly, uh, it makes it really tricky to be, to be able to put them in the stand. Um, there are a couple of children who've lost their ability to stand just because the ankle is deformed. Uh, the rest of it seems to be fine. Though we do 
you know, consider the surgical intervention, but still it poses a huge problem for us. Um, and just moving quickly, uh, conscious of the time. So uh, tone is another factor, very, very important factor. Uh, if they have a decent tone, upright running frame is the answer. Uh, if they have a really, really severe tone, and then in that case, we need to consider a supine or um, the prone standard for them. Uh, usually our children with most of our quadriplegic children, um, especially the dystonic ones, we tend to have them either in the supine or the prone, and we don't consider the upright for them because it becomes too much for them. So yeah, that's, that's about the criteria for the standing frame. Yeah, um, so if you could just look in this slide, this is a supine standing frame. You could see head, head pads there, the, um, head support there. And this comes about a trunk level uh, where you can just strap them across. And this becomes your pelvic support and that's your knee. They're all well padded. Uh, they give the cushioning effect. And then you have the footrest. Uh, the good thing about the supine standing frame is you can adjust the height of the individual knee placements so that in case if the child has got an asymmetry, you know, say, for example, a limb length discrepancy, and then you can adjust it accordingly to offer the necessary support around the knees. And same thing is applicable for the footrest as well. Wow. Uh, this is a bright standing frame, which is nothing but it's exactly the same uh, you have, you know, because they're upright that you we can fit in a tray for them and they could engage themselves in a good activity for the good length of time. And if you could just see here knees and again here you can um, differentiate, you can alter it between, uh, you know, moving it to sideways or moving it inwards. Um, but the, it, it does pose a little bit of difficulty with the asymmetry. The minute they have asymmetry, it's ideal to consider the uh, supine or the prone standing frame. Uh, this is another kind of standing frame um, where widely we use it for the children who've got muscular dystrophy uh, because we all know they lose their ability to be on the feet very quickly uh, in, a, in a very early stage. So what happens is like, you know, we just put them on a frame like this. They start with a sitting position like this and it's remotely operated. So it just gradually brings them up to the upright standing. Right, this slide here. You could see uh, again, the knee supports and you could see the footrest. It's a little bit closer view of the knee support. There you go. And that's not a reading. Okay. okay. <clears throat> the one on your right, the picture that you've gone on your right, where I've got the cursor there. Um, she is a little girl with um, severe quadriplegic. Uh, we couldn't have her either in the stand, uh, so that's that's not even a standard. It's called as a tilting table. It's like a, uh, it's it's a table which you can tilt and move it forward and bring it to upright. So if you could see, we've given all the support for her. That's the headpiece which will help her keep the head in the middle, and you could see those wide straps which comes across the chest, and that's the support for the pelvis. So uh, her feet are quite badly deformed. Uh, we couldn't accommodate in the footrest. So what we have done there is we've just used uh, something called as air splints. Um, it, it's like a sock where you can blow in air so that there is no pressure around the feet, but then it helps us to maintain the position of the feet. So that's, that's what we've used it for her. So that's called as a tilt table. So that's pretty much about the standing frame. Um, so you have, in, in, a, in a nutshell, so you have three types of standards and you decide it based on your GMFCS uh, levels and your further assessment of the head, trunk control, 
the symmetry, the spine, the tone, the feet, and the range of motion around the hip, knees, and ankle. So the next one, uh, we're moving on to lying. Um, until I had, uh, you know, knowledge and or understanding about the 24 hour postural management. Um, before that, even I used to use uh, sitting as a main means of intervention for postural management. And lying is something which we all com comfortably and conveniently ignored. Um, but if you can understand, if you, if you try to think about it, none of the posture occurs in isolation from each other. Lying is connected to your sitting, sitting is connected to your standing. So it's all interconnected. And um, you know, your gravity doesn't magically disappear when, in, when you're in a lying position, it's still acting. And they have proven clearly um, gravity influence on lying alone could um, cause such distortions to your chest cavity if you're not supporting the patients properly in lying positions. So importance of lying can never be ignored. So you need, need to pay attention for lying position as well. Oh. Okay. So um, again, for lying, we have uh, some equipment which is called a sleeping system. In the picture here, you could see like, you know, it's, it's he's an adolescent patient and uh, the other side you see a baby. Um, it, a sleeping system is nothing but, you know, it, you, it comes with a mattress and cushions of different sizes and shapes. You could see that you have a cylindrical cushion, you have a straight cushion. So you using the cushions of various sizes and shapes, you help them maintain a decent position and lying. So, okay, moving on to the next one. Um, if you could see this again, he's, he's one of our um, young adults. Uh, the level of spinal deformity that he's got is quite obvious. We, we, can, we can see that quite easily there. If you could just look here, we have positioned him again using the sleeping system gadgets. But unfortunately, we couldn't use the full system for him because it was too much for him to cope with because the level of uh, scoliosis was so bad. It was entirely covering up the whole entire spine. So what we try to give him here is you know, a part of the sleep system where we could see that his legs are kept in abduction. And you could see a cushion that's going underneath to maintain the level of uh, pelvis and to maintain a near symmetrical uh, lower limb posture. So, you, you know, as I said, like sleep system is nothing but, you know, cushions of different sizes and shapes and you choose based on your assessment. I'm not going anywhere in depth of assessment uh, relative to sleep system. It's quite, I would say it's out of scope for the assessment here in this session. And this is his wheelchair. You could see he's being provided with a custom-made one to accommodate his uh, scoliosis. And this is him moving in his wheelchair. Right, okay. And uh, that's the end of standing. I'll move it. Yeah, I'll pass it on to Jay now. Thank you. Sorry, how are we doing with time? Yes, sir, we have time. Okay, so I haven't got much slides anyway, so uh, quick. Right, yeah, so um, so we did cover um, seating systems, uh, sleep systems, and uh, the positioning and you know, um, cushions and uh, systems that's available you know, uh, during nighttime for lying position. Um, the other uh, important thing is walkers. Um, and again, there are so many products out there like you know, in the market. Um, again, it depends on like you know, um, the age, 
and the level of support that you, you require and the level of ability you know they have so when i say level of uh, ability uh, it could be yes they have very good hand functions very good head control um, but they lack stability and, and you know some sort of mobility uh, in the lower limbs so um, so because they do have very good hand functions they can actually access they can reach out for things they can still participate in school activity um, so we, we want them to use their upper limb as much as possible. So this walker, it's called um, posterior walker, where you could clearly see the head support, that's the trunk support, pelvic support, and, and uh, like a seating you know, cushion there. That comes with all the accessories from head to toe, yeah? So um, what this walker basically does is, so the, child can actually position you know within the walker and you know he or she can be strapped and then these individual external supports are adjustable they are adjustable in terms of height width adjustment depth adjustments you can actually vary the sizes um, so that way it accommodates the growth and development as well uh, but, but what is the advantage of this walker this posterior walker over this anterior walker is as soon as you position the child, you don't see all this external support. You just see the child. And the child uh, upper limb function, like, you know, uh, so they can actually still move their upper limbs. They can reach out for the things that's positioned in front of them and the table, like, you know, so it doesn't really interfere with the access. Whereas these anterior walkers, um, so they don't really provide a good access from the front. In this case, you have to actually position the child from behind and you could see how this pelvic harness and pelvic support, again, they are adjustable, that's the trunk support and you have arm and hand support. And uh, these walkers, they are brilliant and they're very smart. Now, even the casters that's designed on these walkers, they do have direction control where you can actually lock the direction they can't actually move side to side but because they won't have the ability you know as the child develops they develop the the the, um, the sagittal plane movements and then frontal plane movements and later the transverse plane movements so likewise you know when the, you wanted to facilitate walking so you try and lock those wings so so it's not too challenging for them you know when they start you know, walking they can lock the direction so they can practice walking just forward and backward. Um, so it actually limits their you know, level of movement within the walker. And then gradually you can progress, you can unlock the wheels and so on. And also you could see all the level of support that's available. All those accessories and supports on the walker, including the walker itself, is all adjustable. So it grows with them. It, it should e easily you know meet their needs at least for three to four years like you know and we can adjust individual parts to meet the needs um so i'll just play this video so you can see she's a very very severe spastic athetoid um quadriplegic but you can still say like you know uh, that she's able to use this uh, anterior walker and she's able to take few steps. So what we are able to achieve is one standing, so up against gravity. So obviously, you know, she's going to benefit from all the physiological you know, benefits. And another thing is she's taking weight. She's using her own body weight. So that should actually, you know, um, encourage low load passive stretching. And also it facilitates the gait pattern. So yes, using these walkers uh, can actually, you know, um, facilitate their function. And there are so many other postural management equipment available. Um, so it's not just um, the seating solutions, sleep systems, and uh, walkers and standing frames, uh, like special footwear. Um, I've got like, you know, in detail, but obviously, you know, with time restrictions, I'll have to just move on. Uh, there are so many types of special footwear ranging from Pedro boots to Air Force, dynamic ankle foot offices, and so on. Uh, arm gaiters, um, so we have various types of arm and elbow and knee gaiters available. There are inflatable splints are available, particularly, you know, uh, if they are at risk of uh, pressure sore, if the skin integrity is not good. So
So it's hard for us to use semi-rigid or hard materials, you know, like AFOs or splints. So instead you can actually use these inflatable splints. Dynamic splinting, uh, which is again big in the market at the moment, for those people who are practicing neuro and pediatric, they should be aware of you know, the various types of dynamic splinting that's available, like teratogs, um, second skin, lycra suits. Uh, you know, the advantage of using this dynamic splinting, as you could clearly see, it's dynamic. Um, so they can you know, actually um, support and at the same time facilitate their mobility. Uh, the, the main difference between other AFOs or other splints to this dynamic splinting is the dynamic splinting, uh, you can actually correct the rotational deformities, which is more often you see with CP diplegics or hemiplegics, or like, you know, uh, when they will start to walk, you, see, you will see that it's not just adduction, but you'll also see internal rotation, uh, which is hard not, uh, for us to correct using the standard splints. But with the dynamic splint, there are straps that's available. They are basically like an undercar garments. So you can actually use the you know, um, tension within the straps to actually maintain their joints in neutral and you can facilitate their mobility. So there are so many dynamic splints that's available in the market at the moment. Various types of head support where I shared a few slides with you, uh, the bespoke upper, splint, upper limb splints, and spinal jackets. So all this is part of uh, various types of accessories and splinting that you can actually use as part of postural management equipment. Um, so I just want to finish off with this slide. So just to show you the progression over four years. So this little uh, boy, when he started um, walking, clearly he's a CP diplegic. You can see him walking, um, slight, Adduction, scissoring, um, gait, flat feet. Yeah, clearly loses his balance, lack of spatial awareness. So that's him without any air force, without any dynamic splinting, without any walkers. You can clearly see he's struggling. But as soon as you give him the air force boot, and that's called KE walker, which is a type of posterior walker where the child can actually you know, position his or her pelvis at the back and still can access you know, everything from the front. And it's lightweight uh, with the little you know, wheels on it. So they are, it's easy for them to propel forward. And you could clearly see his posture. It's quite symmetry. He's taking weight. He's not actually waddling side to side. Um, still, there is some level of internal rotation. Uh, as I said, with splints, it's hard for us to control any rotational deformity, but that's what we try to achieve in the next slide. You can clearly see that's, can you see the blue undergarment with white straps? They are undergarments called teratox. Um, so we use the teratox uh, and then those straps are, are tension adjustable. So you can actually adjust the tension or the amount of uh, correction you want to achieve. Um, so that should actually you know, maintain the joints, hip, knee, and ankle component in neutral, but at the same time, you know, will not limit their movements. So that's why they're called dynamic uh, splinting. And clearly you can see, you know, we have tried to reduce some level of rotation, but that's at its beginning stage. Um, but as we moved on, um, so with a lot of therapy, other positioning programs, seating, lying, and so on, uh, and then we decided that he is the right candidate for selective dorsal rhizotomy. Um, so that's again a major procedure, and they don't go through that procedure. I know um, um, there are a lot of evaluation and assessments, and then we try all the other options and prepare them. Um, it's not just uh, rehabilitate them, but also prepare them for the surgery. So we did a lot of uh, uh, training, uh, pre training, and then that's the result. Uh, following the selective dorsal rhizotomy. So you can see in the third video, his limbs are neutral. Um, his feet are still flat, obviously, you know, but they are functional, so they don't want to, you know, actually correct his ankle or uh, septal or joint components. So they are neutral. So he, clearly you can see both in the sagittal plane and the frontal plane. Uh, and when he starts walking, 
the difference that you will find, which is quite evident in this video, definitely the rotational deformity has reduced, but you can clearly see he's trying to hyperextend his knee joint. That's because uh, the spastic element has been knocked off due to dorsal uh, rhizotomy. So that resulted in some um, floppiness in his quadriceps or weakening of muscles. That's why the, uh, the, um, the prerequisites training program to the surgery is very, very important. Um, but clearly you can see with, with the elbow crutches, uh, so he's able to walk in a straight line without any rotational. Um, and later, I think it should be on this video. Yeah, so he can walk without his crutches. Um, let, let me say if, yes. So he can actually now walk without any support. But clearly that's straight away after this uh, Russell diazotomy, few months of post-op rehab. So you can see the, the level of correction, the amount of correction you now that was achieved. And um, yeah, so clearly the support, the level of support has reduced from walker, splints, so uh, to elbow crutches and nothing. Um, at the later stage, now he's playing football, like you know, which is which was his goal, like you know, to play football out in the outdoor. Um, but uh, after the surgery, it's not just muscle weakness, also his spatial awareness, like you know, was challenging because all that time he was just walking in a certain, you know, you know uh, limitation in, in a certain plane. So the spatial awareness was challenging. So we had to also do a lot of uh, sensory integration program. Uh, but as I said, with a lot of re-education, with the right level of surgery and with the right level of postural program, um, he, he is now able to, you know, uh, like play, walk, and you know, um, it's all independent. Like, you know, um, he's not depending on any accessories or any, you know, walking aids at the moment. So that's the progression, you know, uh, we can achieve as a physio. So that's all I have today. Um, thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you, sir. So we do have some questions from our viewers today. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll read it out. So we have one question from uh, Purnima Kumari. It is like, she, is it beneficial to facilitate upright position and walking in PT with foot spine deformities with pelvic obliquity in spastic CT. When PT is not in condition to afford the frame for assistive walking at home. So can you please uh, help her? Okay, um, so I, I, my understanding is the question is when, if they can't afford you no know, with the standing frame. No, walking frame. Is it the walking frame or standing frame she means? It's uh, walking at home. Right. Um, I said, uh, it's, it's a very um, gross uh, term. Uh, when you say CP spasticity, uh, again, with species spasticity, I, I actually um, take it, it's a CP diplegia. Uh, even with CP diplegia, so they can have uh, the level of spasticity, the tone, you know, can vary. Uh, with some, you, as I said, as I just showed you, you know, uh, in, uh, in the uh, last video, you can actually facilitate their walking using some basic splints and, um, and the teratox. You don't actually need frame. Uh, but if if they if they lack trunk control, uh, that's where they need some external walking frames. Um, I know uh, back home in India, so we don't have access to all these uh, various range of products. But you can clearly see the concept behind, uh, and that's the whole idea of us presenting this, like you know, um, a topic, you know, to to our friends uh, uh, back home. It's about being innovative and creative and see how we could adapt. Um, uh, I was practicing, you know, back home um, uh, 2000 to 2005, and I was able to facilitate, like, you know, I had uh, my own orthotist who, who was able to design and modify, you know, a few bits. Uh, so, yes, we can achieve, but again, it depends on the level of ability of the child. And the other option to try would be using a, 
uh, crutches, tripods, I think that should be available uh, back home, I guess. So if the walker is not available, still you can facilitate walking. If you're thinking of equipment wise, um, tripods will be another option. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. We have another question from Abhishek. So he, he is asking, I am an IT professional and most of the time the working posture are not very great. For example, looking in laptop screen with neck bent. What we should try in terms of correcting it and if some exercise you suggest. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, hi, Abhishek. Um, thanks for joining anyway. So, though you are in IT, so thanks for joining us. Um, though this uh, topic is focused on uh, for children with spasticity, I, I can understand, you know, why the topic um, title can be a bit um, uh, misleading. Uh, but yes, um, for IT professionals, it is a big thing, obviously ergonomic. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a separate uh, area at the moment. I would suggest actually to take uh, support of uh, the local physio who will be able to uh, analyze your posture and sitting, uh, particularly in your work environment. Um, I, I can actually suggest a few ideas, but it, it will be good for one of the local physio to actually analyze your posture and analyze your desk uh, height, desk space, your chair that you are using at the moment. I know uh, these chairs uh, these days comes with back tilt, recline facility, height adjustable. But bottom line, it is very important when we say ergonomic posture, we talk about 90, 90, 90. When I say 90, 90, 90, uh, it's about your trunk with your hip joint. Uh, so it sh should be 90 degree. And then your hip joint to knee joint should be 90 degree. So if you can actually aim to maintain 90, 90, 90 degree. So, and if you can maintain your trunk in midline and your hip, knee, ankle component in neutral. Uh, also, what we have to make sure is that your feet is not dangling. If your feet is not supported, then like, you know, uh, there is high risk of you actually fixating to one side. And all of us do like, you know, so all of us have tendency to fixate or you know, have our own dominant side. So it is very important to actually have some footrest um, or if you can actually lower your chair or lower your desk height. So it is very important that you, know, the, the, you focus on the height of your desk, height of your chair, and then your low back is, is well supported. Um, I know our physio colleagues like know, uh, know more about it. Uh, I would actually recommend to actually take support of one of the local physio Abhishek. Sure, thank you, sir. Yes. Hope Abhishek, your uh, question got answered. And moving to our next question, uh, so we have it here from Vivek Kumar. Mm -hmm. He's asking, like, in the current work from home situation, we sometimes prefer to lie on the bed and work on laptop for long hours. How good or bad is that for our posture? Okay. Uh, <laughs> because you're limited with the postures that you can attain. I would say, you know, lying down on your tummy is one of the good alternative because sitting constantly, you know, it's quite clear and obvious. Your spine is constantly loaded uh, throughout. So I would say lying down on your tummy is one of the good alternative. And also, yes, um, to Vivek's question. So um, lying on the bed and you know, accessing laptop. Uh, is not a brilliant posture. Um, to be honest, I myself, like, you know, used to do a lot and yeah, I, I on back, yeah. on, on, on yes, back. lying on a back, back yeah, is, is not a good posture. Yeah. Lying on tummy to some extent, yes, it is good. Um, uh, and it's more like, therapeutic because we do spend sitting most of our time. So that actually results in, in developing some hip flexion contracture, which is the muscle in the front. Um, so lying on a tummy stretches those muscles. But lying on your back is not a brilliant posture, particularly people try to use like, you know, too many pillows. Uh, the neck uh, is, is, is put under constant strain and all those ligaments at the back gets overstretched. Uh, so it is not advisable, uh, but there is one a new product which is quite you know, uh, popular here is like, it comes with like a little curved back support with the arm support on it. It's like a little cushion, you know, curved out. Uh, where you can actually, yeah, so where you can actually use that instead of a pillow and, and uh, still, like, you know, access your laptop you know, uh, on your bed. 
uh, but what it make basically ensures is to give a proper back support. And also when you rest your arm, because your arm position is key, when you rest your arm, it tries to maintain the symmetry on the bed. Uh, but if you don't have your arm support, that's where you tend to lean to take one arm support, and then you're putting your spine uh, in enormous like you know distortion and you know tension like an over so which which results in pain and aches so if you can actually maybe try and you know uh, accommodate or even you know there are products you know that's available i'm not going to say what products but on, on online you know, there are a range of products that are available for it professionals who are using more like you know their laptops in the bed but yeah so so but again i would actually uh, take the support of local physio to analyze your posture Right. Yeah, one uh, other thing is, you know, it will be good to incorporate basic stretching program every day if possible. You know, it doesn't take more than 10 minutes if you think about it. You know, uh, at least if you could do your hip flexor stretching and the hamstring stretching on a regular basis, that itself would take care of most of your back problem. Uh, so if you could liaise with your local physios, uh, obviously they'll be the experts and they can give you basic hip flexors and hamstring stretching exercises is something I would recommend. Is it okay, Chandling? Yes, Chandling. Sure, thank you, thank you, thank you, ma'am. So moving on to our next question from the viewers, we have, what are the main score scales for assessment which can be done easily? And you can elaborate this if, we, if you can, sir. Right, okay. Um, so, that that's more again like a, uh, because they're asking for uh, scores and scales um there is so much like you know uh, what i can do is um there is a document you know which is called uh, and if you google you know it's available on google uh, it's called 24 hour partial management program um, or i could actually send the link to the host and the co-host they could share the document um because they're asking for the scores, the scores, there are scores for like, you no know, assessing spasticity, like Ashwat scale. And there are scores for assessing their seating ability, like Chaili's level. And there are various types of uh, like, you know, uh, scores available, you know, to access their uh, seating. Uh, but Chaili's level is one that we commonly use here. And for standing, as Priya mentioned, like, you know, uh, there are, um, like you know uh, the GMFCS, like you know uh, which is gross motor functional classification score um which actually provides you uh, not only the score but also uh, an intervention plan that you should consider or like a recommendation that you should consider um so that's available uh, so if you just google gross motor functional classification score um, so that's available for standing uh for lying um we don't, uh, there is again, Chile's level, Chile's, uh, you know, they do have assessment for seating, for lying, for standing. So they do have like uh, for various posture, uh, which we mostly try and use. Um, and in terms of uh, assessment, uh, I'm just thinking because mainly we focus on the hands-on assessment because uh, when it comes to posture, you as a physio, you want to know whether it's fixed, you know, correctable or partially correctable. As soon as you get that information, that as a physio, like, you know, will, will give us a bit more information uh, to plan our treatment on what level of support is required. Um, so we don't really use too many scores, you know. Um, the scoring is just like, you know, uh, to report, like, you know, what uh, the uh, level of ability. Um, but as I said, it's all available you know, on that document, you know, the 24 partial program, which I can share and at the end of the session you now with the host. Sure, thank you, sir. Uh, we have another question from Purnima Kumari. If PT is coming from rural area, what are the procedures we can use to facilitate walking and for correction and maintenance? The pressure rest of 23 hours. Okay, uh, I, I take it the question is more about how do we manage, you know, if we have uh, children or individual in the rural area. 
um, facilitate, facilitate walking in particular. Um, I, I know uh, it, it's not easy without without these you know uh, accessories. But as I said, like you know, uh, these accessories it might look like you know uh, quite you know um, sophisticated and 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 techy, but it's all like you know uh, we can actually recreate this like you know and and you know uh, you don't have to be innovative. All we need is the basic principle you now of how this equipment you know functions, and uh, most of the walker you know principle. Um, I know like, we, I'm not sure to be honest what is available like you know back home, um, but as a as a as a as a basic level like you know we can actually use the elbow crutches and tripods, uh, or even use like if they are rural. I'm sure like you know uh, even in villages like you know you do get crutches. You know, um, yeah, um, there's another thing that uh, we tried in Bobat uh, treatment here. Like in, it's, it's, it was trialed especially for the children in Africa as a part of an outreach program. All they used is a long stick, and you know I think that should be available. So a long, really a long pole or a stick which you can use on both sides imagine if you're standing in front of the child facing the child and the child is holding as well so you use your reciprocal movement for them to follow it it is quite tricky and difficult and uh, the level of um, the ability, yeah. ability of the child will dictate whether this will work um, but if say for example a mild diplegic i think that should be one of the way which we could conveniently use in the rural area where you don't need anything all you need is a bamboo stick, lo two long bamboo stick, and you hold them and you facilitate. And um, that's one thing I could think of. Yeah. Also, there are straps now available where you can actually strap them around the pelvis, and you can actually hold from behind. Yeah, towel, um, so, like a towel, towel like or you can them. use a towel, like you know, um, um, so which is again safe. So just uh, like put a towel around them, and it all depends on on the level of control and the trunk control they have. But if they have a reasonable, uh, good trunk control, and if they lack pelvic control and lower limb movements, so you can actually, you know, facilitate after preparing them. Obviously, you know, so you do. You now, uh, so I'm not going to, you know, give you like, you know, uh, uh, strategies of how to facilitate. I'm sure, like, you know, uh, most of us know how to facilitate gait. But I you know in a rural area, so obviously, you know, we have to try and adopt this principle and trying to be creative. As said, using towel, like you know, which is again easier. So you hold from behind, and then you try and facilitate the the gate from side to side, and propel, like you know, try and and assist them to propel forward. Um, again, it's trying to be innovative. You know, uh, I'm sorry, like I'm not giving you the various solutions, uh, but we can use the principle and concepts that are actually used in these walkers, and it is achievable to some extent in rural areas. Sure, that helps her. Thank you. And we have one more question from Abhishek, and I hope this will be uh, last for the day today. So the question is, sometime back, Abhishek had an ACL surgery done, to be precise, around 3.5 years back. He completed uh, his writing. I completed my rehab and started this strengthening with gym. I'm quite confident walking, jogging, weightlifting but sometimes due to seasonal changes i feel bit pain in knees this pain goes away after a few days automatically but i don't understand the reason should i do anything uh sorry uh mm -hmm. i take it abhishek must be like between 30 to 40. yes sir yeah so we got yeah, it, it, it depends on the, you know, obviously it depends on the age. It's, it's, it, it will hurt a little bit because they have done the re reconstruction, which means the ligaments are going to take up some of the load of your knee. But then still, you know, the rest of the structure is what you have is what it was before your surgery. So sometimes it's quite possible if you're doing a repeated stretching or repeated uh, weight loading onto your knees it can give you pain um, it depends on the level of pain that you're getting you've clearly indicated that it weans off if that's the case you don't have to really worry about it but make sure you don't do anything when the pain is intense so you need to give time for your body to recover you need to give time for your muscle to recover so that's why it's trying to tell you 
if it's hurting you, which means you need to give it some time to come out of that zone and then it, it's ready for, for, for you to work again. So, uh, it, so I would say alternate with the rest period and the workout period. So that should help. And you can try some physical means. And we should admit we are not musculoskeletal experts. Uh, <laughs> so um, uh, ideally it will be you know, uh, good for some musculoskeletal physio uh, colleagues to jump in and advise Abhishek you know, um, and help him out. Um, uh, but but that's the suggestion you know, uh, Priyas, and uh, I, 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 um, I have to admit that we are not expert you know, um, in musculoskeletal and we don't really uh, keep up to date on like you know, the ACL reconstruction and things like that because this field is so big and things are changing. Yeah, so you have uh, a specialist for ACL reconstruction yeah. at this point. Yeah, so, so. Um, but that's the basic advice that Priya has given you. Uh, yes. But I would actually take you know, uh, one of your local uh, uh, musculoskeletal expert you know, uh, to comment on it. Uh, sure, sir, that uh, Abhishek is uh, writing. It helps. Thank you, sir. So we have, uh, sorry for this. We have another mo one more question last for the day. So it's from uh, D. Vincent J. Raj. So he's saying, good evening, sir. Vincent from SRM. Oh, okay. So my question is, how successful this 24 hours postural support in community? So yeah, so <laughs> I totally understand. Like, you know, um, uh, as I said, I have to repeat the same thing again, like, you know, in rural and community, like, you know, uh, here, to be honest, we both are community, you know, pediatric physio. So here, the terminology community is is, is different to what we actually, you know, uh, think back home. Uh, so uh, we both, uh, I used to uh, work as a community pediatric physio and Priya is still working as a community pediatric physio. So the community term is, is about going out and about and working uh, with the parents in the home environment and working you know, with the school staff and support staff and with the children in the school environment. Um, so that's community to us. Like, you know, um, and uh, uh, like here in UK, obviously it's all available like, you know, in the community. But back home, I take it like, you know, so it, it's, it's not uh, straightforward. It like, an uh, outreach program. Yeah, it becomes more like an outreach. And as said, like, you know, uh, it's, it's very important for us to be aware of what is available and what is available and like to support in terms of this 24 portion program take the concept and liaise with your local authorities or uh, like any rehab engineers uh, and i'm sure like you know we should be able to create or recreate you know um, um, and and produce you know something you know using those concepts yeah and, walking um, frames quite simple walking so, frames i'm sure like the walking frames are available you know if i'm right zipper back frames home. yeah back home zipper frames should be available uh, but again, still you can use like you know um, uh, basic techniques and you know, to uh, to build up you know uh, these. Uh, when I was practicing back home in Chennai, like you know, I had my own engineer and an orthotist who supported uh, my ideas. So it's about being you know uh, creative here and using these concepts, and that's and the whole. It's uh, working together as well. I think we don't we can't do anything individually ourselves because we can't keep exercising again and again. You need these gadgets to maintain the inner um, vitamin that we've got from exercise. So I think orthotist plays a huge role there. Yeah, sir. So it's again MDT. Uh, the whole point of this 24 posture program is, as a physio, yes, we spend time with them, treat them for an hour, but you know they are away for the rest of the day. So for us to uh, sustain the therapeutic benefits, so it is very important that we consider all these other equipments as available. And there are going to be limitations um, with, with what is available and in rural and you know, suburban and urban areas. Uh, but again, as a physio, it is uh, like, you know, uh, part of our role to be creative and you know, use these concepts. So the whole point is just to introduce like what's available today. Um, but again, you know, we still have to work and, and you know, uh, and, and do more uh, work around in, in the community to see how we could actually support uh, individual who need this positioning equipment you know, in the community. Um, as I said, it's about being creative. Um, sorry, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if we answered, but we haven't got slides or solutions to share with. Uh, it's just using the same concepts and, and, and adapting you know, uh, these, these you know, principles and, and trying to be uh, more creative. 
Sure, thank you, sir. Uh, hope that answer is like helpful. And on this note, I would uh, ask Smita ma'am to take over and proceed here. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And ma'am, it was a very fruitful session. And today we came to know many new key points which will further help us out. Uh, well, yes, I would like to add up with the uh, question, last question. Uh, basically, today also we do the same thing, sir. Like, so because we stay in a, a small district and here we have because you know, patients, uh, families which are uh, who are carrying their kids with us, uh, they are not from very good, uh, well to do families and they cannot afford high standard of uh, you know, equipments and gadgets which we have right now. So we have to sit and design uh, with our authorities. We have to you know, use our brains, which should be very cheap and cost effective and should be beneficial to the patient. So the, as Sir said, the same way still we are continuing from. And we don't have any other such options. We have to use creativity into our profession. So thankfully, there are a wide variety of tips and tools that can help improve posture for children with deformity, uh, whether due to a uh, medical condition or environmental causes. There are many ways to help ensure that your children grows up with a good, strong posture that will carry them through a healthy life. Postural deformities are a common problem among children. In fact, many adults' aches and pains are the long-term effects of poor posture or bad alignment that stands in children. There are many reasons why this happens, including bad habits, not broken in time, bad diet, and a lack of regular physical activity, diagnosing postural deformities at an early age makes treatment possible, right? Now, which may prevent serious postural abnormalities. Well, I think as a physiotherapist, we should design a family-centered program focusing on the unique needs of each child, empowering parents with skills and strategies necessary to support their children's physical, emotional, and spiritual health. Now, postural deformities can be a challenge to overcome, but with our help and Parents' determination affected children can start out on the right foot toward improvement, health, and wellness. Our treatment may significantly help to minimize, if not eliminate, postural deformity. Now, I call upon Dr. Veena Srivastava, ma'am, for vote of thanks. She is a zonal head E zone. She believes work hard in silence, let success make the noise. Over, ma'am, over to you. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Very good evening, all of you. On behalf of IVP Women's Cell Bihar State, first, I would like to thank you to the resource person of this event, Dr. Jay Chandran, sir, and Dr. Pedar Sima, for your excellent and interactive presentation. You blessed us with your presence and took out valuable time of your busy schedule. Thanks a lot, sir and ma'am. Now I would like thanks to Dr. Ruchi Varsne, ma'am, for providing a big platform for all of us. I would like to extend my thanks to host of this event, Dr. Ismita, ma'am, who made this event possible. Thanks to all the participants for your kind attention. Thank you, IAP Technical Committee, Dr. Himandri, ma'am, and all committee members, as no program can become successful with a single person. So I extend my big thanks to all of our office bearers of Bihar State, Dr. Josie, ma'am, Dr. Runjin, ma'am, Dr. Abhilasha, Dr. Punima, and all of you. Thank you once again. Thanks a lot, ma'am, for excellent, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Raina. Well, there, no, there is no shortcut. It takes time to create a better, stronger version of yourself. Your body is your most priceless profession. Take care of it. Just believe in yourself 
think positively, exercise daily, healthy, work hard, stay strong, dance more, love often, and be happy. Well, we are eager to meet again. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Smita. Thank, thank you. Smita. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Excuse on behalf sir. of on behalf of IEP technical team, thank you, Dr. Jeff and sir, and Dr. Priya Dushini, ma'am, for wonderful session and all participants for attending this webinar. I would also like to thank Dr. Sanjeev Jha sir and Dr. Ruchi Vashne ma'am for providing a platform for sharing a knowledge. I request to all participants, please subscribe our YouTube channel and follow our Facebook page. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Smita. Thank you, sir. I'll speak, yeah, I'll so speak to you later. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll, I'll speak to you later.